Good morning, everyone. This is Chen Xian Li again. Uh, this se section is a very special call for proposal section. Uh, we invited uh, Professor Rosie uh, from Romania. Uh, she wants to share a special uh, topic, digital citizenship, how to educate the participation. Let's welcome Professor Rosie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity uh, of being here. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful. Thank you for the uh, Open Culture Foundation uh, for uh, letting me uh, present this topic, uh, which concerns me, not only the digital citizenship topic, but also the participation topic. Um, I listened carefully to the, the previous speakers and uh, I must uh, confess that uh, I envy you because uh, uh, you could work in, uh, in environments which were really responsive and, uh, and uh, where trust worked well uh, to uh, mitigate the effects of uh, COVID-19 in the country. As opposed to these cases, to the case of Korea or Taiwan, uh, Romania is uh, is on the other end of the spectrum, where there is a, neither a good digital citizenship education, nor uh, a strong trust in uh, in government measures. We could explain it uh, through historical roots and also through the the harsh communist part of past of the country, but uh, this is not the aim of uh, of our talk today. It's uh, rather to look at uh, how, how can we as a civil society uh, actors, individuals and organizations uh, do, do something for, uh, for uh, a better participation uh, in, in these practices. So uh, I, I can see that uh, the organizers uh, already shared my presentation. Then uh, uh, I should say that uh, uh, we can we can move to the next slide. Thank you for helping me with. Um, of course, it's it's important that uh, uh, that participation uh, as part of the democracy uh, works for as many people as possible. Uh, I I looked at uh, three elements or three frameworks conditions under which participations uh, can work really well. Uh, Webler and Tuller's uh, ideas are very important, I think, about uh, fairness and competence, criteria of fairness and competence. Why is this important? Because uh, usually we, we take more care about competence in participatory processes. We take more care how to organize these processes, how to invite uh, people, how to, how to organize the events and the participatory part. And uh, maybe maybe we tend to neglect uh, the ethical aspects uh, of of the participatory process. Maybe maybe we uh, we neglect the part of uh, of the openness of the dialogue, uh, the inclusiveness of uh, of uh, the vulnerable groups and individuals in the dialogue. On the second hand, there is the digital uh, citizenship issue. We all we all uh, live in in a in a very uh, hyper-connected society, uh, even Romania, uh, we are lagging behind all the European Union countries, I must say, and uh, uh, there is a strong digital divide be between the uh, rural areas and, uh, and the urban areas in the country. So when it comes to digital citizenship, there is also already uh, a problem at the entry level at the access level, because uh, uh, some some people don't have uh, uh, not even the minimal uh, infrastructural conditions to enter the digital highway. Uh, we'll look at the conditions, uh, not only the technical, but also the communicative and also the uh, the more complex participatory aspects of digital citizenship. And uh, thirdly, uh, I would uh, bring into uh, to your attention. Uh, um, a framework of um, competencies developed by the Council of Europe on uh, how uh, an open and democratic culture 
should be based on, uh, on different types of competencies, not only communicative competencies, but many others. Um, we, can, we can move forward. Thank you. The next slide. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, a failed citizen participation project in my hometown. In my hometown, I live in the central uh, Romania in a in a small town called, called Saint George, and uh, this statue was erected exactly twenty years ago. Apparently, we could we could vote for uh, for the ways in which. Uh, uh, the government, local government will uh, will assign uh, this uh, statue project and uh, we could vote which which St. George and the Dragon project we would like more. Little did we know that uh, uh, our 65,000 citizens vote only counted as a single vote in the in the process. And uh, I think uh, none of the public uh, voted for this uh, now so-called dinosaur or scorpion type of uh, a dragon project. It became a little bit of a funny symbol of the town. Uh, however, it's also a, re a, a reminder that uh, uh, if we, we came with this frustration uh, as citizens that our voices were not heard, it's because the process was not open and transparent. We only found out how little our opinion counted at the end of the at the end of the project. Um, next slide. So let's go back to uh, Webler and Tuller's fair and com competent participation uh, criteria. Uh, when we look at uh, these criteria, uh, of course. Uh, the fairness starts with the agenda and the rules of the process. We should ask ourselves the questions whether uh, there is an equal opportunity of, uh, of uh, involving in shaping the agenda, shaping the rules and the conclusions of the, of the participatory process, or we are rather uh, asked at the, at the end of the road and then uh, and then whatever the conclusion is, we, we have no uh, interference with it. On the second hand, discussions. How can we get involved uh, as um, stakeholders, as people with, a, with a, an interest or uh, people affected in a decision making? Are, uh, are we given the opportunity to be present or are we given the opportunity to be represented if we cannot be present at the at these discussions and if we are present are we given the opportunity to be critical why is it so important in a society like ours which is quite hierarchical in many ways very traditional uh, the romanian society in many ways uh, uh, the the whole decision making process by tradition works in a very top down manner rather than a bottom up manner it is, uh, it is an important thing that, uh, that uh, critical thinking uh, is allowed and it is a, is a, a real opportunity for, um, for participants in the dialogue. Here we need a, a shift, we need an educational input to develop these skills and also a shift in mentalities, in ways of uh, thinking, uh, in accepting not only the top-down authoritarian approach to issues, but also to a, a more uh, bottom-up approach. And uh, of course, the competence rules of participation. We usually, we usually uh, take much care of how to organize uh, such participatory events. Uh, we contact people, we, we take care of uh, organizing uh, uh, all the aspects and the logistics of the events. Um, Sometimes we can tend to ne neglect uh, elements in the communication process concerning uh, language. Are we inclusive enough in terms of language use? Uh, can we include all the, uh, all the stakeholders in the discussions or we use rather a, a jargon language, uh, a very insider language that is not accessible to all? Do we give the opportunity for those who don't have the language skills or comprehensive skills to, to somehow access um, 
key ideas in a in a more uh, in a more easily comprehensible format. It's also important uh, in uh, in uh, online uh, online spaces. Uh, we know very well that uh, 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 the World Wide Web Consortium developed uh, a set of recommendations in terms of uh, accessibility standards for for uh, web spaces. Here it can be applied as well, and uh, also the uh, the discussion the way the way the validity works in these uh, in these frameworks whether whether uh, uh, there is a tendency an effort to to reach a common understanding uh, and to to find those common values that uh, that can be based of a base of a dialogue it's also part of the competence of of the discussion but maybe when we talk about values it's also a little bit uh, about uh, about fairness criteria. Next slide. When it comes to digital citizenship, I was uh, I was sharing the idea that there is a strong digital divide in in Romania between the the rural and uh, uh, the urban households. I am I am pretty sure that some digital divides exist in each country, even in Taiwan or even in uh, South uh, Korea, where where uh, the digital highway is, is uh, uh, I'm sure pretty developed. So uh, on a basic level, there is uh, the technical level. It's not only the skills, although this model uh, focuses on skills, but it's also about uh, about access. Uh, how can we uh, make use of of our access opportunities. Uh, what I'm saying, uh, why I'm saying is that this is because many households, even if they don't have a, a fixed broadband uh, uh, opportunity to access the internet, uh, at least uh, the mobile mobile access and at least on on 3G networks is ensured. But uh, for instance, elderly people. Uh, people with less uh, uh, less educational background, people with less technical skills. Uh, there is also a gender divide. Uh, women are less skilled in uh, in ICTs, especially in rural areas than men. So we can we can see all these lines of separation, which have dramatic consequences when it comes to to coping with COVID and access to access to uh, reliable data. Uh, Romania is one of the countries where people uh, refused to to be treated in hospitals because they believed in conspiracy theories they read on Facebook, and uh, people died in hospitals because uh, they they refused treatment uh, and the doctors could do nothing. Uh, there was a case uh, presented uh, two days ago in the in the mainstream media that uh, a very very problematic case of of COVID. Uh, had to should have been transferred to Germany in a in a high end hospital and and uh, he he refused because was convinced that he he will be chipped and uh, and somebody is manipulating uh, and uh, uh, he he is not really ill so it's uh, it's not uh, it's not a simple issue it it costs lives uh, how can you access uh, reliable information so uh, it's it's the communicative aspect and uh, the way local and global awareness is uh, is put in context uh, as a as a part of uh, as a part of uh, the digital citizenship uh, education and also not to man not to forget the the networking agency uh, the way we get involved in a in a higher level of literacy in uh, in online interactions not only as consumers of information but also uh, as prosumers as as people who who get involved and at the next level uh, the uh, interaction which is uh, practical oriented and uh, change oriented not only not only uh, waiting others to do things but also us getting involved in this space and then last but not least the critical perspective critical thinking skills and also rethinking the whole participation uh, process and the way internet can uh, can shape participation i heard uh, very good cases and examples uh, 
provided uh, in in Korea in uh, in Taiwan uh, of platforms where uh, where uh, uh, citizens could get involved and could uh, could not only get information but also provide the vital information which is very important in crisis uh, situations and uh, yes it, it would be useful for us as well to have these uh, uh, citizens citizen mapping uh, crowd mapping uh, uh, practices uh, in on a more extensive level not only in urban areas uh, of young urban professional people who are very skilled in it but everyone can i have the next slide please uh, Rosie, I hate to interrupt you, but uh, I think we have time, is up. Run out of time. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, we have some questions on Slidos. Uh, oh, we have okay. four questions on Slidos. Uh, Great. But still, we run out of time. So maybe you can uh, shortly respond to any of them, and uh, maybe we can uh, re reply this question later on email or any form. Sure. Uh, so, and I, okay. I will share the the slides on the on the website um yeah uh many faded cases under under crisis uh, situations but uh, but uh, bottom up and inclusive uh, civic engagement projects are uh, are mainly uh, isolated uh, civil society organizations projects uh, and civil society organizations uh, are are mainly uh, living in a in a in a bubble of their own. There is uh, too little communication between uh, the government and the civil society, and it's pretty formal. I think it's so much to do on this on this area in this area to uh, improve this communication between uh, uh, CSOs and uh, and uh, and the government. Uh, not only from the government should we expect as a civil society actors but also we should be more proactive and uh, and be more uh, 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 more critical and more present in in all the spaces and discussions uh, there is for instance a coalition for a clean romania a cleaner romania clean in an ethical way not necessarily environmentally way so there are some good initiatives they should be made more uh, more mainstreamed uh yes uh, romania is a member of ogp uh and uh, and uh, there are also some some studies made and i did some research to look uh, how how this process is going uh, is going on uh, how my government would describe the open uh in a very formal way a minimalist way uh, uh, let's let's do what is uh, necessary and uh, provide all those uh, interaction uh, ways of dialogue uh, i think there is a need for a shift and to be uh, more uh, more interactive in these spaces uh, how's people's attitudes when asking them join a discussion policy making yeah uh, again uh, it's a very there is a tiny active minority uh, civil society actors and also young people more active urban people more active educated people are more active uh, and uh, and if you look at the general population uh, in statistics whether they get involved in civil society activities and participatory activities uh, we can see very little participation maybe we vote for a statue for a Saint George and the Dragon statue, but uh, but uh, many people won't uh, won't get involved in uh, crucial issues. How to overcome digital divide? It's a it's a long process of uh, of investment, but it was marked with uh, uh, really uh, scandalous cases of uh, of government corruption. Uh, I think very few countries have an ICT minister in jail. We have one. Uh, it shows it shows how much money is involved and how how much power is involved in the digital infrastructure development and there is a lot to do we'll, we will get uh, european union uh, resilience um, uh, help and uh, out of this help a lot will be uh, invested in uh, digital infrastructure and also combating digital divide i hope i answered the questions thank you thank you so much uh, we'll keep in touch.
And uh, if you are watching our video, please stay tuned. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, for the audience, the next section, uh, we are very grateful to invite uh, PDs. Uh, PDs is public digital innovation space led by Audrey Tang. Uh, for the next 10 minutes, they, are, they have a short video they want to share with us. So please. I believe many people here who have been working hard for the open government have asked themselves the question, what kind of mechanism is needed to enable open government to be implemented and operated durably within government? I'm Yiwen Chan, a researcher of the Executive UN, and we often call ourselves members of PDS. PDS stands for Public Digital Innovation Space, a unit established after Audrey Tan took office as Digital Minister in October 2016. We are a pilot office within the administration. Similar to pioneers in other countries, such as the Policy Lab in the UK, the ATF, and Digital Service in the US. We try to use innovative methods to redesign the public policymaking process and make it more user-centric so that the civil society can more easily participate and the mutual trust between the people and the administration can be enhanced. Before becoming a PDS member, I worked as a lawmaker assistant in Taiwan's parliament for three years, handling proposal drafting, constituency issues, and campaigns. Besides that, I've also devoted myself to environmental issues as an NGO researcher. I spent two years in Eastern Taiwan to conduct public communication among local government, tribes, firms, and various stakeholders. Now I'm responsible for open government. I believe that whether it is a public opinion agency, an NGO, an administrative department, or even just a citizen, we all expect our government to have a more timely response to the needs of multiple stakeholders and make politics and policies more transparent. Maybe you are curious about whether PDS is the only unit within the administration that promotes open government. And if Audrey is no longer a cabinet member, can open government in Taiwan still be pushed forward? First of all, participation officers, in short POs, play an essential role in carrying out the work of open government. The directions for implementing the role of participation officers in the executive UN and subordinate agencies was formulated in 2017. It is an official document approved by the Premier. Since then, at least one person in each ministry should be appointed as PO, and their job is to strengthen the horizontal liaison work between ministries and assist the, and assist the head of their ministries in evaluating policies and politic opinion. The existence of the Directions Appeals not only makes sure the pilot work of open government will be properly implemented, but also ensure the continuity of the open government policy. As the Directions requires, during the policy formulation and promotion process, each ministry should give full consideration to transparency, participation, accountability, inclusion, and other basic principles of open government. At the same time, it also guides POs to have the ability to communicate with the public, translate the official announcement into people's language, and fully record the discussion between stakeholders. To equip POs better, PDS held consensus camps and training courses to discuss with POs what kind of difficulty they've encountered, what assistance they need, we say that we want to establish a user-centric discussion method and POs are our users as well. How can PDs and POs promote public-private partnership together? We accumulate examples and experience through collaborative meetings. By doing so, the principles of open government and real case feedback combine and become more useful. So far, more than 100 collaborative meetings have been held, and every PO has their lesson learned. Now, I'd like to share a case from a Shiba Inu called Xiaomi, and it's honor Mei Dad, who proposed on the joint platform with the people in Taiwan. 
He advocated that Taiwan's railway's transportation should be more friendly to pets, like relaxing the size limit of the pet cage. This issue is related to the Taiwan Railways Administration, in short TRA. Before the online petition gets 5,000 votes on the joint platform, it has not become a real case, POs responded. The POs of ministry take the initiative and raise the issue to the monthly meeting of POs and display the willingness to hold collaborative meetings for this petition. During the meeting preparation, PDS works with POs and civil servants from TRA. We not only invite proponents and seconders to the meeting, but also first line station attendants, train captains, general passengers, etc. Through guided discussion, every attendee put forward their respective needs and experiences and sought solutions that are acceptable to everyone. After the meeting, Medad wrote on his blog, This is the first time that TRA has cooperated with the people, and I can see the civil servants are willing to improve the situation. Through participation, the public increases their understanding and trust in TRA and even suggests a pet-friendly education cooperation plan, hoping to continue the cooperative relationship with TRA. One month after the meeting, TRA actively launched a three-month trial plan to relax the size limit of the package. Our experience shows that when the meeting is handled in an open government way, People's issues can be solved without taking violent protest or action, and the government has no substantial risk either. This is a virtuous cycle where trust is building hereby. Maybe you are curious, is there too much work and burden in one PO's head? In fact, we are trying to make PO's from different ministries working as a team. Even PO from irrelevant departments are expected to give a hand as their own business. For instance, POs from the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Education, and the Financial Management Commission were asked to be moderator of group discussion in the railway's pet-friendly meeting. One more thing worth mentioning is that PDS used to be responsible for all of the presiding work of the collaborative meeting, but we discovered that Serving as a group moderator requires impartiality and a high degree of empathy, which is an indispensable ability in open government work. Therefore, we started to let POs take turns to lead a group discussion in 2020. Being a group moderator, POs have the opportunity to break away from their departmentalism and try to listen to different opinions from the multi-stakeholders on an objective position. This has greatly changed the habits that POs used to do things as civil servants, such as taking an inactive posture facing the outside opinions and being anxious to defend themselves. This experience of the collaborative meeting preparation and group presiding a truly fertile soil for POs growth. We are happy to see ministries starting to hold meetings by way of open government without PDS assistance. The cultural change and mindset collaboration are happening. For example, the Council of Agriculture has organized a series of meetings on stray animals and wildlife protection by using the open government ways. We hope that PDS has been bringing that take away so that any civil servant who wants to integrate more open government into their daily work will not be clueless and confused. Moreover, they are not alone. PDS and PO team are always Welcome back, everyone. Yes, I'll be the moderator, Xin Chen Xiao, and I'll be introducing our next speaker, Chen Xin. She'll be talking about the topic, opening up the black box of CSR with open data the case of stopping footprint. And to briefly introduce Chen Xin, she's a volunteer and a former intern at Green Citizens Action Alliance, an environmental NGO based in Taipei. Who 
a work with the organization focused on carbon footprint project, where environmental advocacy is fueled by open data. She currently works as a software engineer at Impact Institute, a spin-off of the True Price and a social enterprise based in Amsterdam. Let's welcome Chen Xin. Uh, thank you, uh, Xiao. Let me share my screen. One second. And uh, good afternoon, Taipei. Hello from Rotterdam. My name is Chen Xin. Um, on behalf of Green Citizen Action Alliance, abbreviated as GCAA, or in Mandarin, Lusa Gongming Xingdong Liemong. Today, we'd like to share our experiences in the facilitation and the use of open data and its contribution to an open governance system. Um, we will touch upon our experiences in working with both the uh, public and private sector in the project Tommy Footprint or Tommy Zuji. And just in case you're wondering what GCA is, because I noticed that uh, we are sort of an exception here, being a non-governmental body, and probably the only one in this forum. Green Citizens Action Aliens, uh, we are an NGO based in Taipei, and on the slides, there are three major tasks of uh, GTA's focus on environmental advocacy, so first, phase out of uh, nuclear energy, Second energy transition, and finally the disclosure of uh, environmental information. And so then, the top footprint project. Uh, the very beginning of this project can be dated back to around 10 years or so ago, or even earlier. Back then, Taiwan was struggling with uh, the transformation. From industries that come with very high environmental costs. And uh, GCA was trying to uh, develop a strategy to steer the decision to facilitate the industrial transformation. And meanwhile, GCA was all trying to think outside the box on a new mode of environmental advocacy that is um, beyond the traditional, typical way or a more um, conflicting way of the people protesting against the government or companies. And we were hoping to establish a dialogue between those parties to resolve the distrust between them. And so then, it brings GCA into data. And with data, with evidence, GCA was aiming to open up conversation um, based on evidence, based on data. And then the first question popped up. There is no data available, but is there really no data existed? Uh, of course, no, there is data. There are, of course, according to regulations, data from measurements, and data from all sorts of records. But those data uh, are not yet then accessible to the public. So this is where we started, where Tommy Footprint Project uh, sets off. And so then GCA started with seeing Tommy footprint on open data advocacy. And one major achievement, for instance, was the disclosure of the explanations of certain environmental violation fine records. Um, before so, we could only see according to which regulation a certain firm got fined and for what amount. Uh, as you can see on the, on the um, top of this uh, screenshot, um, but with, without explanations, it is very difficult to understand what had exactly happened and to tell how serious the incidents. Can I briefly uh, interrupt you? I think your Wi-Fi is not stable, so if it's okay, I think the staff will, will project will project your your presentations for you, so it will consume okay. less. Wi-Fi. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, I'll have our staff. So where were we? Um, okay. Yeah, 
Next slide, Ben. Yeah, okay. And um, so on the, the figure, you can see that um, this is, as we, as I mentioned earlier, the one of the major achievements, um, the disclosure of um, the explanations of certain environmental violation fine records. And before, so we can only see this uh, on the top of this uh, screenshot, uh, according to which regulation uh, certain firm got fined and for what amount. But without uh, explanations disclosed, it is very difficult to understand what exactly happened. And then GCA uh, embarked on this uh, advocacy on opening up this data. Um, there was a lot of uh, back and forth discussion with uh, both the central and the local governments who are in charge of the data, on which uh, this should be defined as some uh, confidential information, or why can we not disclose it? And uh, finally, we agreed to open this data field up. So from the screenshot below on the uh, left-hand side, you can see that uh, there is an extra paragraph of text describing what the incident was about, for what chemicals, emissions, at what level uh, it was exceeding the standard. And now on the right hand side, if you navigate to Taming Footprint website, you can find all environmental data sorted, organized and linked. You can search for a certain company firm, check their environmental performance, and it is worth mentioning that the advocacy of open data is a very lengthy, very long process. It is not really about uh, the publicization of data itself. It is more about having a continuous uh, recursive conversations with all stakeholders, convincing them that uh, opening up data, opening up uh, conversations with the public, this is not something horrible or to be scared of. And uh, by opening up data, creating a dialogue based on data, we also build trust among the government and citizens. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I have a slightly different slide. Is it possible to maybe try again using my slide? Okay, perfect. Um, so to date, there are around 10,000 users per month making use, uh, sorry, 700,000, so to one, I think, making use of a town footprint project uh, database. And what impacts and benefits have you made with this? We know companies have been using it for their supply chain management. One concrete example in their CS CSR report it stated that they would regularly check how we go to the website to see if their suppliers have any incidents or violations on environmental regulations. And uh, the website uh, um, has also been used in green finance. We knew this because as GCA would um, often get calls from uh, firms and companies on requests to update some of their films some of the records because the firms were asked by their investors or banks about their environmental performance as the investors have seen from a uh, time footprint database when they are trying to get a loan for fundings. And uh, finally, GCA ourselves also make use of the data on advocacy for responsible consumption. Uh, GCA has developed a mobile app called uh, Scanning Before Buying, or it's called a demo, whereby uh, scanning barcode on product, consumers could immediately see all the data regarding to, uh, the environmental performance of the company which produces the product. And so altogether, this has brought more attention. Okay, there's uh, some connection issues with uh, the speaker. Um, do we have the speaker on stage? 
maybe we will have a wrap up without the slides. I think it's the slides that's causing the uh, connection issues. It's consuming. Oh, I, I think he, she, I will lost a speaker. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so back. sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, I think that the slides is consuming too much bandwidth of data. So can we have you wrap up like the last three minutes of your, your, yeah, your yeah, presentation? Yeah, of course. I'm at okay. the very end. Sorry, I thought I'm uh, in the com uh, country that has the most internet speed, but apparently not. <laughs> this is the last, second last slide and about uh, our next step. So starting this year, Tom Goldfin has embarked on a more ambitious goal that is to build an ESG database. So back to GCA's initial motivation that we mentioned at the very beginning of this talk. Um, with uh, GC, with Tommy Footprint, we were aiming to steer the transitions of companies with high environmental costs, urging companies to take more of their responsibilities. And uh, we now um, we now face all the pressing problems on climate change, CO2 emissions. I think you are not seeing my slides. Uh, that's sad, but um, so now we're beyond uh, pollution control that we are working towards today. And uh, we are working towards a broader ambition of sustainable development, therefore, this time we are further expanding the database to include data from a wider aspect from for all uh, ESG. And uh, this is still a work in progress, but we hope and we believe that opening by opening up data, there is an important first step for working towards a standardization of those ESG data. And uh, finally, still not seeing my slides or not. Are you seeing my slides? Uh, yeah, this is the end of my uh, talk with a lot of uh, chaos on behalf of Team Coming Footprint. I would like to thank you all for your attention and as well as uh, the Open Culture Foundation for hosting this forum. And I think we still have a bit of time for questions. Yes. Questions. Now we have some time for Q and A. Um, do we have any submissions to ask the speaker? Yeah. Um, yeah. If not, I, I can. I actually have a question. So I'm always curious how. I mean, when you interface with the government's data or with your own data. Uh, what's the experience like? Do you, do you uh, wish that uh, you have more, you know, better format or better availability for, for the, from the government side? Oh, um, format wise. Um, I think it is a good question. Um, this is also what we're constantly working on. And I think first, it is also first about uh, opening up a specific data and then we discuss we uh, how to call it fine-tune the, the format that uh, we, we would like to have and actually if I navigate back to the previous slide if you can still show it on um, the part that I do not have much time to uh, to talk about yeah uh, my, my screen I think Okay, is it possible? On um, our next step, um, for instance, uh, for the ESG database that we are building now, we would also like to urge the government to further open up more data, for instance, uh, especially the financial subsidies we are giving to firms and companies. Um, if you show my screen, not this one, on the ESG data. Okay, yeah, we have a question. Um, I think you can read the question. I can answer in Chinese yeah. or English if you like. Yeah, this is also what I'm uh, actually touching upon at the moment. So financial subsidies that we are giving to firms and companies, this is uh, one of the most, uh, most 
wanting data that we are um, urging the company to opening up with. So are we still subsidizing companies with extremely high environmental costs or companies that are lagging behind on their transitions? Uh, this is still a work in progress still, but um, this is what uh, we are working on at, at the moment. Yes. Okay. Um, do we have time for one more question? Um, okay, so do you want to take on the next? Yeah. Um, 企业实质受益人, this uh, I'm not, to be honest, not completely familiar with, but oh, and what uh, government platform is our data from? Um, so our currently our data are either from uh, the IPA, Huan Bao Shu, and also we use data from Jing Guan Hui that I don't know the English term for it. Uh, um, mostly they're the financial statements of uh, the companies. And uh, we use them to sort of map out all the relations among different companies, the investment flows, so that we know uh, what uh, relations between the companies are. So who is uh, like whose uh, child company, that those sort of things. And then we further mapped also all of the companies to um, their uh, factories, firms, plants, uh, Gongchang. And then per, per this Gongchang plants, we have all the emissions data and pollution records. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for changing for, for your presentation. It's very, very insightful. Um, and that will wrap up this part on civic space. And we will take a very short break and we'll go into the next keynote section. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.